welcome to Edison Open House Transport Futures 2021. In this session, we're showcasing the work of Lion eMobility. It's a Swiss engineering services provider providing services in the eMobility sector. Joining me is board member Ian Mukherjee. Ian, hello. Hi, nice to meet you, Vivian. So tell me, first of all, a bit more about Lion. OK, well, um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd say that it's really a German company. So our operating vehicle is German, and that's quite important. Um, wholly owned by um, a, a Swiss company called Lion E-Mobility, which is the listed entity. But it's important uh, that uh, Lion is in Germany, and especially in Munich, because I'd say that uh, Munich and uh, Germany in particular is the beating heart of Europe's EV industry. Some of the bigger companies are in Germany, VW, Daimler, and of course, uh, one of our partners, BMW, are, are based in Germany. And uh, German policies have been very green for a long time. And they've really been leaving uh, pretty much the rest of the world behind. So I think that being in Munich and being in Germany is an enormous advantage because I think that's going to be the heart, uh, you know, certainly the European heart of uh, EV, but also to some extent the global heart. And I say that because although China does a lot in EV, very few people in Europe would know uh, Chinese car brands. Uh, whereas, you know, we all not only know German car brands, but aspire to buy them. And they're all moving to uh, EVs. And the problem with the US is the US got left behind a bit under the last administration uh, of Donald Trump for eight years, uh, sorry, for four years of Donald Trump. Uh, we've been in a situation where uh, policies weren't progressed. Now that's gonna change rapidly under Biden, but for a few years, it's gonna be catch up for the United States. So tell me about the range of services that you provide. Okay. well. Uh, I, I should probably start off by telling you that Lion's history was initially as a sort of engineering consultancy in the battery space. So we used to do bits and pieces of work for people. And then about eight years ago, we combined with a company called TUV, which is very well known in Europe as one of the big testing businesses. And uh, we set up with them a, um, a testing business for car batteries. I don't mean lead acid, I mean lithium ion, the ones that would go in an, in an electric vehicle. Uh, that business is now seven, eight years old. And we've, of course, learned a lot and developed, you know, a lot of uh, competence through running that business. And then we moved into two other lines, if you like, because we want to be, uh, you know, in the battery space. We want to be a producer of battery modules and solving problems. So we have two businesses. One of them is with a partnership we have with BMW, where we take BMW batteries um, and we do some re-engineering work to put them in batteries, and, uh, to put them, sorry, in buses and trucks. And we're doing that already in North America uh, with the drive there to need an oven-ready product that's certified to go in to help with urban transportation. We're doing that already, and that's a rapidly... Uh, growing business for us. Alongside that, because we have, you know, 30, 40 engineers and we've been involved in the battery space for over a decade, we have our own technology um, called the light battery. Um, and I'll go into some detail about that later. But it's our product. Um, it has some unique features. It's immersion cooled. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But one of the important things is it that it does is it helps with range anxiety because not only does it have a good range that's capable from the battery, but also it can recharge really quickly if you get a fast charger. And in my mind, I think that if you can have a battery that charges in 15 minutes or less, which is depending on how fast you are at the petrol pump, roughly the same amount of time it takes to fill up a car, go in and buy a bag of crisps and a um, you know, a chocolate bar, if you can do that by plugging into a supercharger and get pretty close to a full tank, range anxiety goes away. 
So there are sort of core businesses we're in testing. Uh, we have what we call our integration business, a very close partnership with BMW, which is uh, hopefully going to deepen further. And I'll talk about that later. And then our own battery, uh, where we have a tier one OEM supplier company that we're working closely with that is uh, that we hope will use this product in a uh, series production vehicle at some point. So help us out by describing where you fit uh, in the sector. What's your particular USP here compared to what's now becoming a, a really quite crowded market? It is a crowded market. And I think, you know, depending on the level of sophistication of investors, I, I think I, I'd explain a couple of things. We don't make cells. So we don't make uh, what most people would call batteries. If you think about, you know, a Duracell battery, we don't make those. We make modules. They're the big packs made up of supercell units that are put together that will go into a car or a vehicle. So we make those. So there's a casing, and then there may be thousands of cells inside. Cells can be of different types. They can be prismatic, they can be pouch. We use cylindrical um, in our light battery, and I'll come back to that later. It's because we immersion cool it. It, it works with uh, cylindrical. It doesn't work so well with prismatic or pouch. Um, so we don't make cells. We're a buyer of cells. And our job is to add value in the design um, of the battery module itself um, with, as we say, immersion cooling, um, with the BMS that we use. We also, you know, we have our own battery management software. That's also really, really important because safety is so important. If you've got thousands of uh, lithium cells crowded into a small area, uh, I'm sure you know lithium isn't always as thermally stable as we'd like. Uh, lithium batteries suffer from something called thermal runaway. So it's got to be a very well monitored and uh, well uh, protected environment. So you need good software. So our job is to put that whole system together. And there are a number of other uh, uh, competitors that do that. And in fact, a lot of the OEMs, the car companies themselves, are doing it themselves as well. Um, and our hope would be if we come up, you know, if people like our product, they can either license it if you're a big car company or um, for a, a sort of second tier OEM, they may say, well, we'll just buy yours uh, off you. So, you know, uh, but what, what I would say, Vivian, is, uh, you know, the, we're in such early stage for the whole EV process, you know, I'm in it and sometimes it feels like, you know, we've, we've been in it together for, for years, but actually we're really, really at the early phases of the whole EV rollout cycle. So if I can describe it and be a bit trivial about this, but it's, you, you are essentially doing a pimp my battery service. In other words, you're, you're taking a battery and you're customizing it to uh, the, to whatever your uh, suppliers or your, your, your customers' what, uh, requirements are? Yeah, pretty much, uh, pretty much. You know, there are, um, you know, we, we take the cells, uh, we think about what the end use will be. Some people may want a higher discharge rate. Some people would say I'd sacrifice discharge rate for range. There are different chemistries of lithium ion battery. So our job is to go and weigh and think about that. Do you, you know, does somebody want something cheaper and generic or do you want something really high performance? If you do, come to us and we'll try to figure out what the right battery chemistry, the design would be for the use that you want. And, and, and you know, it, it's, people are gonna want different design constructs to solve different problems. So we've said that it's a competitive uh, landscape at the moment, but how has the landscape changed apart from becoming more crowded? Well, I mean, it's competitive. It's going to be a very bumpy journey. And one, there's an awful lot of money coming into the industry. So that's going to create more competition, number one. So I'm talking about private equity. I'm talking about what they call the SPACs in the US, 
which are rain, raising billions to go into the industry. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the OEMs are putting more money in. I think it's public knowledge that GM recently said they were going to spend $35 billion over the next five years getting in and getting ahead in the EV race. Um, and when you see that amount of money, on, the, on one hand, it's exciting because you think, wow, this is going to accelerate the rate of progress. But on the other hand, it means for a, a smaller company like us, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of competition popping up everywhere. So that's the one side. The other side, of course, is where the money goes. You know, I, I'm sure, you know, there are questions that regularly come up from investors and clients, which is, you know, where is battery chemistry going to be? What's the right lithium battery chemistry that's optimal um, going forward? Will solid state take over? In which case, why do I need a battery module? I'll just build, I'll just buy this sort of metal block with, you know, two, uh, you know, terminals on each end, and that will work just fine. Or, you know, of course, fuel cells uh, come up as well. And, and you know, I'm, fuel cells are going to have a role. The, the way I think about it is, it's great that money's coming in because the money will help us figure out which is the right way to go. And the right way to go is, is finding a product that's affordable. Because if we can't make it affordable, then it's not a mass market product and we're not going to be able to drive carbon emissions out as effectively as possible. Um, and it's got to have range and it's got to be safe and it's got to be sustainable, as sustainable as we can make it. Otherwise it becomes self-defeating in some ways. So there's a lot of money coming in, which will help solve the problems, but it's going to be a lot of competition but I think for the industry as a whole and for mankind, the competition is, is really important. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of the light battery. Uh, just tell me uh, how it, it, uh, it's going at the moment, what the development process is and what are the major advantages? Yeah, I think one of the problems with um, EVs and lithium ion battery modules is range. What stops people buying often is, have I really got the range? And the problem, you know, I have a neighbor and he was, he was gonna buy a car, I won't say which one. And he looked at it and it said, it's about 240 mile range, but I'm not quite sure where I live. I can easily get access to a charger and it's really an overnight charge. So he didn't quite have the comfort level to say, yeah, I'm definitely going to do it. So he bought, he, he actually bought a petrol engine vehicle and said, you know, I'll wait another X number of years. So the holy grail is if you can say, look, I've got a vehicle and it can charge within 15 minutes. And that's what we have with the light battery. Um, and just to go into a few technical details, the problem with uh, lithium ion batteries is heat. Um, if you try to charge a battery very quickly, you're putting a huge amount of energy into this space in a short period of time, and that causes overheating. So what you've got to be able to do is you've got to be able to remove the heat from the battery. Um, and ideally, what you want to do is keep the battery always operating at a pretty linear temperature range. Probably something around 38 degrees is perfect, where you then don't degrade the battery, it doesn't shock the battery, and so batteries need to be cooled if you're going to supercharge them. Uh, and if you supercharge a battery and you cool it, what's the most efficient way to do it? Th there are not a lot of immersion cool batteries around. And this is quite important. If you're going to immersion cool, you're better off doing it with cylindrical cells. They're like the Duracell batteries that you get for remote controls. And we use something in our light battery called the 21700. Uh, cylindrical cell. And all these cells are put, hundreds are put in supercells, and then there'll be thousands in a module. And what we do, which is fairly radically different, is we immerse all the cells in a coolant. And that coolant is pumped around the battery and can be pumped really quickly. So that enables us to remove the heat really quickly. So if you're doing a fast charge on a battery, that heat can be removed quickly to allow you to have that thermally aggressive event to take place. So 
our light battery, our hope will be that we'll be picked up by somebody to say, look, this is a good battery. It's got great performance. It's got a good C rate. Uh, that's the discharge rate. It, it can be charged really, really quickly. Um, you know, the current model we have is 85 kilowatt hours. That's a very powerful uh, pack. And you can charge it, what we call moving from a state of charge of about 10 to 15 percent to 85 percent in hopefully sub 15 minutes. That way, with the, I, you know, I've no doubt there'll be lots of superchargers around. They will grow. They're not that expensive to put in place. And as more EVs get picked up, we'll know where they are. In fact, you know, Tesla's spending a fortune putting them in the US in different places. It removes your range anxiety because you'd have the same range anxiety you would have driving a petrol car. As long as I can find a petrol station, I'm ready to go in 50 minutes. Same thing with the supercharging dock. The other thing, if you wouldn't mind me giving a plug, is next on the uh, 17th of June, we're actually doing a drill down into our light battery. So we've got our chief uh, technical officer, uh, head of engineering, uh, Michael Gepper, who's gonna do a presentation for investors on more the technical details of how it works. This is a really interesting area, this idea of supercharging, because what the industry seems to lack at the moment are common standards and consumers find it irritating that there are different standards, there are cards, there are apps, there are all sorts of things. Do you think there will be a common standard and is that going to be a big boost to you or is it going to be a hindrance? No, no, a common standard would be great. I mean, look, for humanity, the common standard is 100% necessary because we need it for mass adoption. The goal of the world is to have mass adoption of electric vehicles as quickly as possible with price down so they're affordable. Um, and, you know, that's important for all of us. And so I think car manufacturers and supercharger manufacturers will be forced to adopt more common standards. Otherwise, it, it just ends up being chaos. So I think, I think we'll get there. As I said, you know, we're in the really early stages of this whole accelerating curve of EG, EV rollout. And this is one of the many problems that needs to be, um, you know, solved. But you're well placed because, you know, having this immersion system means that actually supercharging is going to be a, a good thing with your batteries because they'll be safe and they won't overheat. Exactly right. And, and as long as we know, um, you know, what the supercharger technicalities are, we can have our batteries work with pretty much any supercharging product. You know, the key question is, you know, you, you, you really need the right adapters, the right heads, the pins, all that kind of stuff, the inverters. Uh, as long as you know, and there's a more common standard, then it works for everyone. And, you know, I, I hope that will be the case because we want mass adoption of EVs. We need it. It's Betamax versus VHS all over again, isn't it? <laughs> but in a different industry. Uh, tell me, what is the relevance of ESG to your business? And uh, I mean, many of uh, uh, the companies in this area, of course, driven by net zero and environmental concerns. But for your particular business, are you much more aware of ESG now? Is it something that investors insist on? Um, is, does it have an effect on your share price? Well, I mean, you know, frankly, we are in the business of helping other people meet their ESG goals. So, for example, for bus companies, uh, not just manufacturers, but for the end user, for a bus company, for a transport company on a certain route, we help them achieve their zero carbon goals, right? So we are, I'd say, number one, we're at the heart of ESG because that's our job. But if you go to the next level below that, which is, okay, uh, we're in the business of helping people get to zero carbon. What about our business? Um, and, and I think, you know, there are two important points. The key one will be lithium recycling, um, which is something that we're thinking about longer term. It's in its infancy. There's not 
a lot of places around, but it's an, again going to be a very, very big growth business over the next 10 years, probably really ramps up in about seven to eight years time. And the reason why is most of these batteries can function for 10 years, if not then in a second life in storage for another 10. So the recycling business for battery packs doesn't really start for a decade or so, but that's going to be really important. And, you know, what we're looking at, uh, and, you know, we have this uh, very good relationship with BMW, and they're very focused on this. They want to be able to say, our battery packs, we've looked for as much recyclability as possible. Um, but it's really early days for the reason that I mentioned is these packs can last for, you know, 10 years on the road. And then, you know, what will happen is many of these packs can then be recycled in a second life which is a storage for perhaps another decade. Uh, but, you know, that's a big part of ESG for us. And then on the whole, I'd say, because of the type of company we are, we've got a lot of young engineers um, and young people at our business who care a lot about the environment. You know, they, they very much have, have grown up with climate change being more front and center, and they care about our carbon footprint. You know, we've moved to a new premises in Munich now, and we're kind of starting an audit on what our carbon footprint is in that premises as well. So we've got it mapped out in, in all ways. So we'll be not only helping people get to zero carbon and be at the heart of ESG in that respect, but also be a very responsible company and longer term make sure that our batteries that we go on to series produce can be sustainably recycled. And indeed, there's quite an issue at the moment about traceability of lithium. You know, where has it come from? Has it been mined in a sustainable uh, way? And do you think that will become an even bigger issue in the future, particularly with uh, perhaps Chinese sources of lithium, which are the major source at the moment? Yeah, well, I think we've seen this play out with cobalt, right? So in LMNC, uh, so lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese batteries, the cobalt uh, that's sourced from the DRC is controversial. And, you know, already you're seeing companies like Tesla saying, we're just going to use less cobalt, more nickel um, to get rid of, you know, we, we are stuck with lithium until somebody, can't, you know, it's, it's a complicated one, and, and Vivian, you'll know it, being a science correspondent. When you look at the periodic table, there's not many other places you can go to um, <laughs> that, that work. So we're kind of stuck with lithium. And I think what we need to do, I mean, there's Chinese source of lithium, but also, you know, uh, Chile is a big source of lithium. And I think when we look at it, we've got to make sure that the carbon footprint of producing that lithium stays within an acceptable range. Um, and I think when we produce our, if we go into series production, we will have an assessment of the carbon footprint of the manufacturer of that battery, of which most of it will be in the cells. About 70 to 80% of the value of a battery module are the cells. So it's the cell producers where a lot of the weight will be on them to, to, to make sure that um you know it's sustainable but you know many of them are very good companies this is panasonic in japan it's lg chem it's samsung these are are you know really really good companies they're socially responsible and they're definitely thinking about all these things so i think we're always going to want to get a source of bat cell supply from who we think are, are good esg suppliers yes it's no longer a choice is it it's a necessity yeah. Yeah. I think the consumer drives that. It's even going to be less us. It's going to be the consumer themselves who say, you know, I'm not buying this car unless you can answer the following questions. And then the car manufacturer will say, I won't buy your battery module unless it meets the following standard. That's the way the industry is going, the way it should go. And, um, you know, good for humanity. So you've outlined a bit where you think the battery sector is going. But what about the future of transport in a more general sense? How do you see the future, Ian? Well, you know, it's, 
It's interesting because I think we're going to go through, especially if I stick to sort of land-based transports, right? Um, I think it's a revolution. And it's, it sort of sneaks up on you. And then you wake up one day and say, oh, my God, it's changed. It's a bit like <laughs> somebody sent me a picture the other day of the old phones that we used to have when we, uh, when we grew up. You know, they were landline, big red or blue British telecom phones, and you picked them up and you dialed. I mean, that was in my childhood, but I feel like a dinosaur already because uh, my daughter the other day said, oh, I've lost my phone. And we, my wife and I were joking. That never happened when we were young. It was impossible because it was always in the hallway. So we're going through a revolution. And I think it's driven by a number of factors. If you think about cars, they're such it, it, it's such a wasted economic resource in many ways because it's the second biggest thing that we you know spend money on in our life after a house and then we leave it on the driveway for probably 23 hours of 24 hours a day so it's a bit of a waste really, and it just happily rots over 10 years or decays or becomes outmoded so number one i think when we look back we'll say wasn't it funny we were cars were flooded parked all along the road, nobody using them. Some would sit there gathering dust. I think it's all changing. And I look at my kids, I've, I've got, you know, my children are mostly in their early 20s and they don't drive, they haven't passed their test and they get public transport or Uber. Their way around is, um, by the way, they called everything Uber now. Uber is just, you know, in fact, mum and dad getting a lift is kind of Uber. But, you know, that shared transportation, is going to be is going to get bigger and bigger, and I think autonomous is coming a hundred percent. And I think this this uh, uh, this sort of collaboration or move together of uh, autonomous vehicles, shared transportation, and electric vehicles is going to revolutionise transportation, just like the mobile phone has, you know. And it will be more efficient. There'll be less waste. We won't sit with the car on our drive. But actually, um, you know, there are other things which could be quite revolutionary. I mean, you know, Elon Musk, you know, visionary guy, um, you know, he's been looking at energy storage. In California now, you may or may not know that, you know, as more and more energy comes from renewables, by the way, that's wind and solar. It's great if it's windy and sunny. If it's not, you need baseload or you need storage to provide it. So then you have to have uh, big banks of storage capacity or some way of generating baseload, which hopefully doesn't use carbon. But guess what? Your car may become a mobile storage device because there's a big battery in it. And now maybe your car can plug two way into your house. So if there's cheap electricity when it's a very windy, sunny day, you can charge your car. And then on another day when it's cold, uh, wet, and there's no wind, uh, and electricity prices go up, you could discharge it. So there are all these revolutionary things that I think are happening. And over the next 10, maybe 20 years, we're going to see them all come together. It's going to be pretty exciting. And Lion is very well placed to take advantage of that future. I think so. Ian Mukherjee, thank you so much.